person in a community group is one less person trying to live out Christianity on their own. One more father discipling his children is one less fatherless home. One more person being saved is one less person spending eternity in hell. One more person this year that attends Celebrate Recovery is one less person that continues to struggle with their sin. One more person attending Jobs for Life is one less person that's not being able to provide for their family and getting the integrity that God had for them. wasn't quite emotionally ready for I was expecting a different video. I thought we had our disciple video we were going to play and the one more, one less video playing there, but that's the perfect video for this because this is what this is all about. This is what the potential is all about of two churches coming together because we believe we can fulfill what God has called us to do in the Great Commission. We're better together. That there will be more disciples made, there will be more people baptized, there will be more people who are headed towards an eternity separated from Christ and be brought into the kingdom of light because of what is happening among us today. That last person on the video, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but was Marissa Hamrick. The beginning of February, she tragically in a moment of weakness and despair listened to the lies that the enemy was feeding her and she took her own life the hardest thing I've ever had to do in ministry was stand on this stage and speak at her funeral but we have this hope in that she had placed her faith in Jesus Christ and professed him as Lord and Savior and there the enemy could still kill and destroy her earthly life but he could not take away her eternity And I'm praying that God continues to change more and more eternities through the power of the gospel. He left us with this job to go and to make disciples, right? Baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded us to do. And so with that one thing in front of us, I just want to talk for a few minutes about keeping the main thing the main thing talking about how easy it is in the Christian life and and being in the church for the main thing to slip off the table and, and for other things to be the focus, for other things to be the priority. We can say that reaching people and the glory of God and advancing the kingdom and building the church, that all these things are the main thing, but so many times we can slip in our own our own pride and our own agenda and our own wants and desires. I was watching a 30 for 30 documentary. I love documentaries, whatever the subject, but you throw sports on top of it. I love it more than anything. And so I was watching this 30 for 30 documentary that was talking about the 1985 Chicago Bears. Any Bears fans in here? Anybody remember watching the 1985 Chicago Bears? I, I mean, I wasn't even alive, but I can see and, and remember seeing the highlights on ESPN all throughout the years. The Jim McMahons, you know, William, the Fridge, Perry, uh, Walter Payton, right? Sweetness. You see these highlights over and over. That team is arguably the greatest NFL team of all time. If you look at what they did in the playoffs, it's unreal. They outscored their opponents 91 to 10 in the playoffs. Just destroyed everybody. And if you ask a football player, especially a professional football player in the NFL, what's the goal? What's the reason you're doing this for? Why are you willing to, you know, bash your skulls together and to run until you puke and to put in all of this work and effort? Why are you playing this game? The Super Bowl will be the answer, right? That's what we're playing for. We're we're playing to win the Super Bowl, and the 1985 Chicago Bears accomplished that goal. But when they reached that goal, if you would have looked at Walter Payton, sweetness, arguably the greatest running back, if not the greatest football player of all time, if you would have looked at him in the final minutes of that game, you would have saw something else was really his priority. 
Their media relations director said that as the final seconds ran off the clock in the Super Bowl in which they were winning the game, he said, if you would have looked at Walter, you would have thought we had lost. Once the game was officially over, he went directly to the locker room. He didn't celebrate with the team on the field. He didn't shake hands. They said he tore off his jersey. He threw his shoulder pads down. He went down the hall and he changed in a broom closet. He didn't even want to be around the team as they celebrated the victory of the Super Bowl. And you say, what in the world? You've just reached the pinnacle. This is what you said you've played for all of these years. Why this reaction and why at this time? Because he didn't get to score one of the touchdowns in the Super Bowl. And we can moan and groan and think, you baby, you suck it up. Why, why are you whining? Why are you complaining? They had been on the goal line twice. Jim McMahon runs one in and then the very famous play where you had this almost 400 pound defensive lineman, William the Fridge Perry, stumbling and bumbling into the end zone. He got one of the calls. A defensive lineman got a call over their star running back. And he was mad because he didn't get the fame. He didn't get the glory. He didn't get to run the ball in across the goal line. But if you would have asked him a year before, Walter, what's the goal? Super Bowl, he would have said, right? But when it, the rubber met the road, when it came to that point, he showed that his priority was not truly winning the Super Bowl. And so many times... Walking this Christian life, we can say that, you know, this video is the main thing. You know, making disciples, reaching people who are far from God is the main thing. But when we're really put in the moment, do we show that that's truly our priority? Do we show that that's all that matters? Christ being pro proclaimed and people who are far from Him coming into a relationship with Him. We can hear stories like that of Walter Payton and think, man, what a crybaby. What a selfish jerk. What I mean all about you? You didn't get to score the touchdown, and so you're mad, even though your team won. But if we're honest, we can do the same thing, and I'm including myself in it. That when we don't get our way, if I'm not the one that's carrying the ball across the goal line, am I just as happy because the team is winning? And so I want us to... Look tonight in Philippians chapter 1. If you have your copy of God's Word, very briefly, I'm not going to be here long. We're going to get back to worshiping together because that was powerful just in that first song to hear all of your voices and hearts together worshiping and inviting the Holy Spirit in here among us. But today I want to look at, at, at a position that Paul's in where it, he was put to the test. Okay, Paul... You say that proclaiming Christ is the priority of your life. Well, let's just see if that's really the case. Let's tighten the screws a little bit and see if that's really the position of your heart here in Philippians chapter 1. We're going to focus on verses 15 through 18. And it's important to know that Paul's in prison at this time. In these opening verses, he, he talks about the, the situation that he's in, the afflictions that he's endured. And here we hear about these rivals that he has. These antagonists that are preaching the gospel, but they do it out of rivalry. They, they do it out of you know, trying to steal some of Paul's platform, thinking they're going to get some of the, of the glory. They're winning people to Christ while Paul is stuck away in a prison here as he writes this letter to the church at Philippi. And he says in verse 15 of chapter 1, let's read these verses. Some, these rivals, these antagonists towards him and his ministry, indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. And here's the verse I want to camp out in, verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give us this heart, this mind that Paul shows us here as he is imprisoned, as he is shackled, as his rivals are boasting and trying to antagonize him through preaching, thinking they're gaining some glory, I pray that you would remind us that it's not about our glory at all, that it's about your glory, that it's about preaching the gospel, that it's about reaching people who are far from you 
with the good news of what your son did for us on the cross. I pray that you would convict our hearts. I pray that you would change our postures, that you would fix our minds and hearts completely on you. Make us one tonight. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So here, Paul shows us. He says, this is what is my priority. This is the focus that Christ be proclaimed is all that matters. No matter what else happens. No matter what changes come my way, Christ is being proclaimed. And in that, that is my priority. And so that's where I want us to get tonight. Not that it's just you know, the pastors from the stage saying this, but for every one of our lives, are we proclaiming the gospel when we go through our lives? When we talk with our kids, when you're in the break room at work, when you're in your apartment building or walking up and down your street next to your neighbors, through everything we post, is Christ being proclaimed? Is that the priority of our life? Because Christ is the only hope in and for our community. So I want to ask two questions. Two questions to, to kind of inspect our hearts. Questions you can easily and quickly apply. Every single one of us can ask these questions of ourselves and say, is this true? Am I showing that this is the priority of my life? Christ being proclaimed. The first question is, what's your posture? What's your posture? Now, now I'm not talking about physical posture, right? Obviously, I'm talking about something deeper and more real than that. When I say what's the posture of your life, I'm talking about a particular way of dealing with something, a particular way of considering something, an attitude or an approach to life. And specifically here, I'm talking about our Christianity, our walks with Christ. What's the posture and the demeanor and the attitude and the approach that every single one of us has in our lives? Here Paul's in prison. He has every right to, to, to bow up and to be mad, doesn't he? he? He has every right to want to fight back against these people that are taking advantage of this, that he's sacrificed and, and he's given so much and he has every reason to respond in that way, but we don't see that, do we? What then? Then in everything, whether in pretense, whatever situation it's in, if Christ is proclaimed in that, I rejoice. I was watching a, a TED talk a while back. And it was done by a Harvard professor. She was a social psychologist. And her name was Amy Cuddy. And she talked about this study that they did dealing with people's physical postures. They talked about power poses in this study, and she was using the TED Talk to teach people about how they could do well in a job interview or, or when they were giving a presentation in front of people. And she talked about this little hack that they had figured out through the power of posing in our posture. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but, but she's a Harvard professor, much smarter than I'll ever be, and she had some data to back it up. Here's what she said they did in their study. They compared the way people stood for two minutes at a time. And they took a group of people and they had certain people stand in power poses for two minutes at a time, right? They, they, they called one the victory formation, where you had both hands held high and, and your chin was up. It's the natural response that you go to when you win the game. Hopefully when Duke loses in a minute and I check my phone, I'll be able to shout in for victory. Yes, they're gone from the tournament, right? If you're a Duke fan, I'm sorry, but Carolina through and through. But, but they, they had people stand that way, and then, or they'd have them stand almost like Superman, you know, chest bowed out and, and their, their hands on their hips like this for two minutes at a time. Oh, don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> then they had others stand in, in, in more fearful poses with, with their hands in their pockets and their shoulders slouched. They, they had people cross their arms and look angry. They had, they had people rub their neck as if they were fearful and afraid. That was the only difference between the people. They ate the same things. They allowed them to drink the same things. The only thing they changed was how they stood in their posture for two minutes. And she says at the end of the study, they proved that by forcing certain postures, you literally change the chemistry inside of your body for the good or for the bad. 
just by the way they stood. She would say, if you stand in this power pose, it changes the, the cortisol levels and the testosterone levels and all these different chemicals and hormones for the better when you stand in this power pose. She was encouraging people. She said, before your job interview, find a bathroom and go in the bathroom and stand in this power pose for two minutes. Can you imagine that? Imagine if you're the one doing the interview and you walk in and that person's just standing there in the bathroom looking at you. <laughs> like, the interview's over. Don't even worry about your power posing. You didn't get the job. But she said through this study and this scientific backing, checking their blood and checking the actual chemicals inside of their body, standing in these poses changed us for either the good or for the bad. But more than our physical postures, what do you think our spiritual postures show in our life? What way are we really living well, what are the postures of our heart and of our minds? Are you walking around with your, your fists clenched and just angry that, man, I've been sliding, I've been wronged, and, man, everybody's got it coming. I'm just ready to pop somebody in the mouth. You know those people, don't you? They don't literally have their fists clenched, but when you meet them, you're just like, man, I'm sorry for whatever happened to you. I don't know why you're so angry, but just this posture of your heart. Or maybe it's that pride pose. That it, man, it's, it's all about me, and it's all about me winning, and, and my victory, and my fame. Or maybe it's that fearful, just rubbing your neck and afraid. I don't know what tomorrow holds, and I don't know what, what, what the next day is going to be, and I'm so afraid of what's going to happen because of what's happened in the past. And we live in these postures, don't we? They affect our day-to-day -day life. But I believe we see the posture of Paul in this moment is bowed down in humility, isn't it? That this has to be the posture of our hearts when we follow Christ. Whatever you want, however you want it, whenever you want it, Psalm 95, 6, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. It's yours. Whatever you want. And listen, if it's scientifically proven that standing in a power pose changes the chemical structure in our bodies for two minutes, i got to believe that, that living in this pose of humility changes our lives spiritually, doesn't it? To say, God, I, it, it's not mine, it's yours. Whatever you want, whether in, in pretense or in truth, if Christ is being proclaimed in that, I rejoice. Whatever you want, whenever you want it. That's the posture that he proves. And the second question I want to ask, not just our posture, but number two, with our lives and with that posture and with the priorities that we show, what are we proclaiming? I want every one of us to ask that. With the way you live your life, what are you proclaiming is the priority in your life? Is it your career? Is it your family? Is it your education? Is, is, it, is it just more dollar bills? It, it, what is the priority of your life that you're proclaiming with the way you live? Here he says that in, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. The word there is used multiple times as preached and other times in the New Testament to be to show, to, to declare, to be taught, to speak of. And I know the easy thing is to say, well, well, I'm not a preacher, so I'm not proclaiming or preaching anything. It couldn't be further from the truth. Every single one of us is proclaiming and preaching something every day of our lives. And I'm not just talking about with our mouths. Yes, we need to be proclaiming Christ to the people around us with our words, but we also need to be proclaiming Him with our actions, with our lifestyle. What are you proclaiming with that Facebook post? What is that really showing is in your heart and in your life with that text message that you're sending, with the way you spend your money, with the way you responded to that coworker, with just that attitude that you carry around with the gossip or the lies or the complaining and the murmuring, guess what? When people see that in their lives, it's saying something. It's showing what is truly the priority. It's showing where our hearts truly are. All of it's preaching. All of it's declaring. 
And I'm not saying that we need to all take up residence on the street corner with a megaphone proclaiming Christ. But what I am saying is that many times our actions and the whispers and the things we say behind closed doors make a bigger impact than the other. They speak much louder. Our actions speak much louder than the, than the words many times. And in this passage, Paul's been attacked. He's been imprisoned, he's been afflicted, he's been persecuted, but he kept the priority proclaiming Christ no matter what. And as I close, I just want to remind you and encourage every one of us in here together that the enemy hates what's going on. If he can keep this from happening, he will do anything, share any lie, you know, split any family, you cook up any type of hatred that he can. And if he can get us to buy into it, he will, because he does not want to see this happen. Because lives are going to be changed. Community is going to be transformed. I want to end with one illustration. I read an article that I think proved that's so true, and I saw how Christians live so many times, especially in situations like this. The article I read explained the difference between a group of thoroughbred horses versus a group of donkeys when they're attacked. It explained exactly what happened, and it said, you see what happens when the group of thoroughbred horses, when they're attacked by an enemy, by some predator that's wanting to attack them and devour them, what they do is they'll gather into a group, they'll put all their heads together, and they'll use their legs to kick out against the enemy. But the poor donkeys, in their stupidity, and they're not thinking when they are attacked by an enemy, instead of putting their heads together and kicking out, they'll put their heads to the outside and they'll begin to kick each other. The enemy's over here and they're kicking and they're harming and they're hurting each other. Is that not a picture of Christians sadly many times? When we become attacked, instead of putting our heads together, our hearts together, encouraging one another, instead we turn on each other, we face the enemy, and we kick each other. May I encourage you, may I plead with you, don't throw the cheap shots, the backstabs. Instead, throw the encouraging words. The helping hands. Hey, we, we, we disagree maybe on this, but let's pray together in it. Let's show love in it. Let's truly seek the Lord in it. And so tonight, I pray that through this, we begin to put our heads and our hearts together. And we face and kick the enemy and not each other. That we put the priority on proclaiming the gospel and a laser-sharp focus on a future of helping people far from God find hope in God. Hey, in keeping the main thing, the main thing, turn your Bibles to Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. And I want you to look at this picture as you're turning there. What's going on in this picture, y'all? Oh, it's funny. <laughs> What's going on in this picture? Somebody said it. They're in love. How do we know that these two frogs are in love with each other? How do we know that they're in love with each other? Huh? They're, they're not paying attention to the flies. They are what? They're paying attention to each other. Their eyes are completely focused on each other. What are they supposed to be doing with those flies? I have a good student in the room. They are supposed to be eating the flies, right? But instead, they're not. They're so in love with each other. They're so fixed on each other that all the things that are around them that would be there to distract them, things that would be good for them even, they don't take a second to look away from the one that they love. Revelation chapter 2 I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know 
you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But, but, I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from when you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Repent. John, in his letter here in Revelation, wrote to seven different churches in Asia at this time. One of those churches that he focused on was the church of Ephesus that we just read. He wrote this letter to them. This church of Ephesus had been around since about 52 A.D. The apostle Paul was the one who founded this church. It had had the disciple John as one of its elders. It had had Timothy, the protege of all preachers, to be one of their pastors for a period of time. They had been thriving for about 40 years. They had faced so many threats from without. Ephesus, guys, was in a large city of Rome. Ephesus was a place known for its idol worship, for its goddesses and gods. It was a place where pressures were constantly on this church of Ephesus from without to conform to the things around them. Inside of Ephesus, if you wanted to go to the mall, to the Agora, before you could even walk in the gate to go into the mall to buy something for your family, you had to grab some incense and sprinkle them and burn them as an outward sign of your loyalty toward the emperor. There were 14 temples inside of Ephesus alone, inside of its city um, limits, 14 massive temples to all sorts of gods. But there was none like the temple that was built for the goddess Artemis. Two football fields big, 127 marble columns as high as this building held it up. It is still one of the seven wonders of the world. The temple was built there to domination, the emperor. All of the gods were actually pillars on top of, I mean, on the bottom of Domination's temple for him to outwardly show to everybody there, I am held up by the gods. His statue was placed on the top of it with his fist in the air saying, I rule. And in the face of all of that, even in the persecution that Domination put on this church, they still were thriving. They were rejecting all of that. It was for his namesake, for Jesus' namesake. They were not about Domination or any of these other gods. They had also faced and fought battles from within inside the church. We read there that they had experienced false teachers who had came in to try to get them away from the doctrine of this, the grace of God alone, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus alone to atone for sin. False teachers that came in and tried to twist that with them, but they had stood that too. They had withstood all of it from within and from without, and Jesus commended them for the things that they had done. But he gives them a warning. He gives them a warning that I think is relevant to us, his church, today. We live in dangerous times, guys. We live in an area, in a culture, in a world where there's a whole lot of gods and a whole lot of idols around us in there. We see that there is competition for our loyalty to Jesus at every turn. Even in this room tonight, all the phones that were out a while ago were not taking notes. They were checking the score. <laughs> and you know it. There's incompetence. Constant competition for loyalty. We live in dangerous times, but let me tell you, church, the dangers today are more subtle and more sinister, especially from within. From the outside, it can seem like everything looks good for ourselves and our families and our churches, but there's something deeper and maybe more sinister moving. A commentator wrote this quote about Revelation 2, 4, and 5. He says, There is at present little outward signs of decay at this church. They have resisted evil and false teachers. They have shown toil and endurance. But the great searcher of hearts detects the almost imperceptible symptoms of an incipient decay. In the text, Revelation 2, 4, Jesus says, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. 
Here's what had happened to this church, and here's what can happen to each one of us in this room. We can start looking at the flies. We can take our eyes and our focus off of just Christ and Christ alone and begin to get so distracted by things all around us. Those flies in our lives and in our churches could be a thousand things, couldn't it? It could be sports, it could be relationships, it could be TV, it could be all those things that are real obvious, but I want us to look at the more sinister, the more cunning thing that might be there, the good things. This word that Jesus uses here through John, the word abandon, is a Greek word, afaami. It's the same word, guys, let's get this, it's the same word that he uses in Matthew when it says they left their nets, and followed him. They can, we can leave our nets and follow him, and we can also leave Afiami him. Reminds me of a story in the Bible from a lady named Martha you're familiar with. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered the village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from you. How quickly, guys, we can leave the God we love for all sorts of good things. The writer of the wonderful hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, wrote it for us and said, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. He knew our tendency to walk away, to take our eyes off of Christ. The crowd, the same crowd, guys, that cries Hosanna, the same crowd that cries crown him, can turn quickly to be the same crowd that says crucify him. Oh, church, we can leave our nets to follow him and then leave him to mend stupid nets and to fix things that make no sense and don't matter. Jesus says this, but I have this against you that you have abandoned, you have left. The love you had at first, this word that he uses here, love, is agape, love. Kenny preached on it this morning. Didn't know he was going to, but he did. Preached on the agape love of God. This is the love that comes from God. This is a love that is filled with action. It is a love that's not just words. It's not just brotherly. It's not just make you feel good stuff kind of way. This is the love of God that they had walked away from. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians when Paul wrote his letter to this church. And he said this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body even to be burned, but I have not love, I have gained nothing. We must have love. Too often in our service to the Lord and doing the good things that we can do, offering your body up to be burned, selling your possessions, giving up your stuff, doesn't that sound like that's a good thing? Preaching and, and, and speaking the word in the tongues of angels. Doing things that it says it's going to be awesome. Y'all know what I'm going to do, don't you? <laughs> we become, it says, without love. In our churches, all of our preaching, all of our ministries, all the good things that we, we do, without love, we end up being an annoying brass ringing in people's ears that they can't wait for us to just shut up and leave them alone. I'm serious. So prepare yourself. I'm not going to do that to you. You've seen that done a thousand times. But what if I kept on? I appreciate that. I was going to do cowbell, but everybody, when we knew where we'd go with that, so I didn't. Guys, can we fall into that? In our churches, even in our evangelism efforts, 
you know, preaching Jesus to people, talking to Jesus, or talking to people about Jesus, and it, without love, they just want us to leave them alone. We're annoying. We're a resounding gong inside their head. There's no melody to it. There's nothing that rings true with love. I believe that this church here in Ephesus was relying on their own love. Brotherly love. Family love. Feeling love. The love that a human can produce. A few years back, I visited a church. When I did care to churches, I traveled uh, or talked to the pastor on the phone and got all the directions and whether or not I should wear a tie or not, whether or not I should use the King Jimmy and all that good stuff. And he said, yeah, you're going to love it up here. We are a very loving church. You ever heard that before? We're a very loving church. And I thought, okay, that's, I, I, ain't nothing like walking into a loving church until I parked in somebody's parking spot. <laughs> no joke. No joke. Move your car. I'm the preacher today. I don't care. Move your car. Okay. Got you, ma'am. And then I, when I went into the service early and I sat in the back to really sit there and pray, and guess what? Y'all know what's happening next. No joke. You're in my seat, and that's my family seat. I'm going to be honest with you. Didn't feel a whole lot of love in that place. Oh, sure, they loved each other. They loved with that family kind of love that they had known each other all lives. But it was void of the love, agape, that God gives. There's a remedy for this, though. Jesus gives it to us. He gives it to the church. By the way, guys, the lampstand had not been removed. He's warning them that it will be if you don't get back to your first love. Now, here he says, Remember, therefore, where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. Remember, repent, and reproduce. And this is how we can avoid this in our individual lives and in our churches. We need to remember from the heights in which we have fallen. Here's what we need to always remember, church. I am a sinner, and you are too. I didn't say you were sinners. I didn't say that I was a sinner. I said that I am a sinner and you are too. And get used to it. We are all sinners saved by the same grace of God. And we need to extend that to everyone. And we need to not forget the fact that we are sinners too. It will prevent us from having this pride of who's in my house. It's not ours. It's not ours. We need to remember from the heights in which we have fallen. Let me tell you a story about myself real quick. Ashley, my wife, sitting over here tonight, praying that I don't mention her. <laughs> praying that I don't ask her to come up on stage. Ashley, will you come here for a minute? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I remember when I first, the first date with Ashley. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to tell you what. From somebody who looks in the mirror every morning, <laughs> I was awful proud to be on a date with her. I mean it. I wanted to take her back home to the, you know, my buddies. Yeah, yeah. you see who I'm with tonight? <laughs> pretty as she can be. Still pretty as she can be. Still chase her around the house. <laughs> Hopefully I catch her every now and again. <laughs> pretty as she could be. We pull in her driveway at the end of the night. Pull in the driveway within the night. And I'm thinking, oh, I will get... I'm thinking to myself, there's no way she'll ever let me kiss her. You can ask her, this is the gospel truth. I said, do you mind if I kiss you? <laughs> Man, she said yes. I didn't know what to do. So I kissed her. I thought it was some sort of charity thing, you know. She had read and was kind of help your underprivileged ugly brother thing. She was doing that. She let me kiss her that night. I'm going to tell you what, a few months later, we, were, we, we, we began dating. And uh, on the way up to Kayser, I lived in Lincoln. On the way up to Kayser, I stopped on the side of the road. There were some pretty flowers on the side of the road. And I, I stopped my truck, and I jumped out, and I grabbed all them flowers in that field I could. And walked up to her house, and there I stood with them. <laughs> and 
And I didn't know this, but she told me later on, she said, I always told my mom I would marry the person who picked me flowers and brought them to me. Boy, I sure am glad I stopped that truck. <laughs> Guys, don't forget. Don't forget how beautiful Jesus is. Gaze upon his beauty in the morning. And to know that he loves you. He wants you to kiss him. He wants to be with you. He wants to marry you. You. Me. Oh, churches, sometimes we tend to forget that. We need to remember who we are and who we become in Christ. And that will keep us maybe looking on him a little bit longer. He says for us to repent too. To repent. We need to realize where we are sometimes. And do an honest evaluation of ourselves and our churches. To say do we need to turn this around. Repent means turn around. Change your mind. And we need to do that. Take an honest evaluation of yourselves and of your church and of your families. And say wait a minute. Wait a minute. Think about this for a second. Are the lost being saved in the name of Jesus being glorified through it? And if not, we need to repent and we need to change. Obedience always leads to action. Last thing, he says we need to reproduce. Do the works you did at first. You hear that? Do the works that you did at first. The agape love that's in you is an action love that causes you to do. Do those works that you did at first. What we don't need is for everybody in here to go back and do a marriage retreat with Jesus so we can get our feelings back for him. Because those feelings will come and go. Those feelings will come and go. What we need is to go back and let the agape love of Jesus get in us and do what we did at first. Now, what was it that we did at first? What did we do at first? We trusted in him completely. And we had all the confidence in the world in him completely. If your salvation did not begin that way, then maybe you're holding on to religion and church stuff. To save us. Instead of Christ. Tell you another story about Ashley and I. We finally got married. It took us a year, but she, she married me. And I will never forget my wedding day. Now, she loves her daddy. She's an only child. Loves her daddy more than anything in this world. More than me. That's a fact. Well, maybe not. The story kind of throws that out. She started walking down the aisle, and she was crying hysterically. That is one of two things. <laughs> and I thought, oh, man. And she, look, I'm, and when I say crying hysterically, I almost brought the videotape in here or not, but it was on VHS. And I don't know how to get that to play in these modern things. <laughs> so she was crying so much, and I thought she's not going to, here's what I thought as she was a person, she's not going to be able to leave her daddy. Seriously. She is not going to be able to leave her daddy. And what am I going to do? <laughs> And she came down that aisle, and she was just still crying, just crying and crying and crying. And her daddy gave her away, and she came over, and she, you know, they, you grab arms, and she's beside of me. They started reading off the vows, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> she ain't asked, they ain't asked her yet. And then Ashley did something that I'll never forget for myself spiritually in my walk with Jesus. She leaned that little head of hers over on my shoulder. Still crying. And I knew then, she trusts me. She's laying on me now and not her daddy. She trusts me wholly and she's going she's gonna to marry me. That is the work in which our faith began. It is the first love what we all need to do is lean our heads back on Jesus. 
just on Jesus. Take your eyes off of all the flies, off of the good stuff even, and lay your head on Jesus again and say, I fully trust in you, and I have full confidence in you and you alone. What would happen, y'all, in this world and in Cleveland County if our lampstands go out? If we don't return back to our first love? What happens when there's no lights? What happens? The lost perish. The lost perish. And the name of Christ is not glorified. I urge you, I urge myself to return to our first love. As an act of outward expression of this tonight, we are going to participate in the Lord's Supper together. There's nothing says community like us sharing in the blood and the broken body of our Lord and Savior Jesus together. 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, for, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, we also, he also took the cup and said, after supper, and say, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Four reasons why we participate in the Lord's Supper. It's an act of obedience. He said, do this. It's an act of remembrance. We remember, and listen here. You cannot remember what you've never experienced. You cannot remember what you've never experienced. You cannot remember if you've never accepted Jesus. You cannot remember that he died for you unless you've experienced it. We also participate in the Lord's Supper as an act of proclamation. We are proclaiming together tonight as a church that Jesus Christ died for us. That it is his blood and his blood alone that atones for our sins. We also do this in anticipation. He's coming back, y'all. I read that somewhere. He's coming back. He's coming back for each of us. We have stations inside of here. Two at the front. Or two at the front. Sorry, four at the front. Two at the back. Math kind of donkey here. <laughs> four at the front. Two at the back. We're going to play some music. Guys, spend this time remembering the Lord together. Anticipate his coming. Father God, we thank you so much. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the preparation time of this sermon and service tonight. How I need to get back to being that little boy that's got his Bible under the, under the covers with his flashlight. So excited reading the word. Not prepping for sermons and services, just reading the word. Me and you. Lord, I thank you for reminding me that I just need to lean my head on you, on your shoulder, completely trusting in you. I am marrying you. You have married me. And God, that we are going to walk through eternity together. You've got it. You're okay. or Everything's okay. God, I pray that your blessings would flow tonight as your presence is here with us. In Jesus' name, amen.